I'm Heather Martino. I'm an interpreter and a board member at the Robbins House. Today I'll be talking with you about Black abolitionists, the history from the inception of the colonies all the way through to emancipation. And a word of warning, some of the topics I'm going to be speaking about um, may be a little difficult for people to hear, but definitely necessary. For as long as whites enslaved Africans into this continent as forced, seasoned, and raped laborers, Africans in their diaspora have been fighting back while also creating the economy, buildings, agriculture, for instance. As Nicole Hannah-Jones states, America wasn't a democracy until black America made it one. From the initial resistance at the inception of slavery, through the slave revolts and other forms of, slave, of resistance, the push toward racial and ethnic progress in this country originated from these very populations. Their tireless yet fatiguing endless pursuit continues today, including in reporting history. Nell Irvin Painter explains, many Americans cling to race as the unschooled cling to superstition, fostering persistent discrimination in our laws and distribution of resources. African Americans have been just as persistent in fighting for the ideals promised in a true democracy, despite uphill battles against systemic oppression. For each hard won legislative and legal victory, there's been backlash and there have been backslides. As W.E.B. Du Bois said, the slave went free, stood a brief moment in the sun, and then was moved back again towards slavery. The colony of Massachusetts was the first to codify slavery in the body of liberties in 1641. In this colony, the government continued to make the law more and more restrictive, further clarifying the language to include the offspring of enslaved women, to prohibit interracial marriage, and to fine free blacks from assisting fellow blacks in escaping their enslavers. However, with each passing year came more and more legal challenges from black residents of Massachusetts, some ending in personal victories for individual freedoms. All these cases were rooted in current law. None of the cases were able to alter the words of the law to grant all black people natural rights to freedom. Jenny Slew, a woman who was born to a free white mother and a father of African descent, had been kidnapped and enslaved by John Whipple in 1762. She took her case to court in 1765 and was granted her freedom and paid damages since her status as a citizen ultimately flowed from the status of her mother at the time. Another well-known and contentious case was that of Adam, who had been brought on as an indentured servant for John Saffin on a seven-year term that began in 1694. When it was clear that Safin, who was a very vocal racist and who, and who had been a supporter of slavery, intended to renege on his terms and enslave Adam, he escaped his enslaver by leaving a farm he was working on. In addition to this case being linked to a heated battle between Safin and anti-slavery advocate Sam Sewell, it went through more than one round in court. Sewell had been underhanded and unethical and dragged it through the courts over and over, trying to buy himself wins. But in the end, Adam won his freedom in 1703. There are many cases like this prior to 1772, across the colonies and in Massachusetts. However, it was the Somerset case in England that ultimately inspired a new wave of legal actions taken by enslaved blacks in Massachusetts. And it ultimately resulted and freedom for all of the blacks in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. James Somerset was purchased by a British customs official, Charles Stewart, in Boston in 1769. His enslaver took him to England, where he was able to escape and find support among sympathetic whites who claimed that his slavery was unlawful. In 1772, the Somerset case was brought before the courts and it was ruled there was no legal foundation for slavery in the mainland of England and in Wales. These laws didn't extend to the colonies, where local laws still allowed for the practice of slavery. Somerset's case inspired over two dozen anti-slavery petitions to the provincial legislature in Massachusetts between 1773 and 1775. With the 1780 Constitution, penned by John Adams, came this article 
as he was a vocal opponent of slavery. Article 1. All men are born free and equal and have certain natural, essential, and unalienable rights, among which may be reckoned the right of enjoying and defending their lives and liberties, that of acquiring, possessing, and protecting property, in fine, that of seeking and obtaining their safety and happiness. Elizabeth Freeman, also known as Mumbet, who had been enslaved in Sheffield, Massachusetts, not unlike James Somerset, sought for her freedom under the law of the land. At this point, it gave all men and women equal rights. She ultimately won her freedom in 1781. Quack Walker, who had escaped his enslaver and was severely beaten for it, was involved in a series of trials regarding his assault and battery, and also his freedom, which had been promised to him. During the course of the trials, which ended in 1783, the Chief Justice held Walker's rights were protected in the state constitution and the man who wanted to enslave him was charged with assault and battery. Effectively, this ended slavery in Massachusetts. In the early years of the New Republic, black abolitionists found themselves at odds with some white abolitionists who were advocating for the colonization of people of color. The American Colonization Society, ACS, was formed by whites in 1816 with the purpose of resettling freedmen in a white-run colony in West Africa. Despite a few black entrepreneurs giving early support, most Northern African Americans saw this as a ruse meant to remove vocal dissident black men and women and keep slavery intact in the nation. Free people of color, instead of supporting colonization efforts, affirmed and defended their rights to full and equal citizenship in the United States. David Walker, a free black North Carolinian who was living in Boston, wrote Appeal to Colored Citizens of the World in 1829. This urged the immediate and end of slavery by any means necessary, as well as black education, equal employment, and community organization. Walker and his supporters had formed the Massachusetts General Colored Association in 1826 with aims to demand these rights for people of African descent. In 1827, the nation's first black newspaper, Freedom's Journal, was launched in New York, creating strong ties between radical black abolitionists across the country. Following suit, William Lloyd Garrison, a white man from Newburyport, Mass, launched the Liberator in 1831. He hired black printers, and black writers, and he supported many black abolitionist orators such as William Wells Brown, Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, and Mar Maria Stewart. The Black Convention movement was created by Northern men of color to rally free African-Americans around emancipation, education, racial justice. From 1831 to 1835, there were 11 national conventions of free people of color and many state and regional conventions at which policy was debated, money was raised for fugitive enslaved people, and Black-run institutions were supported. In 1836, a group of Black abolitionist women in Boston took direct action to prevent the return of Eliza Small and Polly Ann Bates to their enslavers in the South, charging the courthouse and rescuing two female escapees from custody. Not long after this, from 1837 all the way until 1850, no escaped enslaved person could be returned from Massachusetts to the South without a jury trial. This wasn't the first, and it certainly was not going to be the last time that black women were at the forefront of social justice activism. In our own town of Concord, Massachusetts, Susan Robbins Garrison, resident of the Robbins House, became a founding member of the Concord Female Anti-Slavery Society in 1837. In the early 1830s, Concord was still largely unsupportive of activism around abolition. So by and large, it was women who led the charge in anti-slavery activities both in our town and across the Commonwealth. During the 1840s, Concord played host to a number of famous anti-slavery activists like Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass. Although support for the cause increased over the year, it wasn't until the lead up to and the passage of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, which compelled the Northern states to cooperate in the return of fugitive slaves from the South, that support for the movement grew from a wave to a swell. Not only were black abolitionists involved in anti-slavery societies and activities across New England, but they were active participants in ensuring the safe passage of innumerable men and women who had escaped their enslavers. During a time when the law compelled them 
to turn them over to authorities. Black abolitionists such as Lewis and Harriet Hayden in Boston were among the many who put themselves and those seeking refuge at risk for the greater good. One man who was given shelter and passage to safer grounds by Lewis Hayden was Shadrach Minkins. After escaping slavery, he came to Boston working as a waiter. When the Fugitive Slave Act was passed, men posing as customers came into his place of business and took him into custody to return him to the South. Black abolitionists stormed the courtroom and rescued him, delivering him to temporary shelter in Concord, Massachusetts, before going onward to Canada. As I mentioned, one of the main causes championed by black abolitionists was for equal education. In 1850, a Boston resident named Benjamin F. Roberts, whose daughter had to go to school far from her home while passing a number of white segregated schools, filed suit against the city of Boston in order for her to attend one of the schools closer to them. The lawyers in the case were Charles Sumner and Robert Morris, one of the nation's first African-American lawyers. Judge Lemuel Shaw ruled against the case on the grounds that he didn't think the court should be involved in racial justice. However, Benjamin Roberts, undeterred, was aided by Sumner and bringing the issue of segregation to the Massachusetts legislature. Concord's Ellen Garrison, daughter of Susan and another resident of the Robbins house, signed a petition in support of this bill. As a teen, Ellen had moved to Boston and became involved in anti-slavery, in education and railroad equality, and in indigenous people's causes. In 1855, the Commonwealth banned segregated schools in the state. It was the first state in the nation to do so. 1857 saw the creation of the Radical Abolition Party to remove slavery from national territories. It was created by black abolitionists like Frederick Douglass and James McCune Smith, the first African-American to hold a medical degree and white allies. Within a few years, by the time the Southern states seceded in the winter of 1860 to 1861, Black radical abolitionists had transformed the anti-slavery movement into a national fight for America's Republican ideals. In May of 1861, in the early days of the Civil War, three enslaved black men sought refuge at the Union-controlled Fort Monroe in Virginia. The commanding officer, Benjamin F. Butler, rather than return these men to the enemy, claimed the men as contrabands of war and put them to work as scouts and laborers. Soon hundreds of black men, women, and children poured into the Union stronghold. From the outset of the Civil War, Congress began the process of methodically ejecting legislators who actively supported the Southern cause, the seditionists. Therefore, there was enough support to pass legislation that authorized the confiscation of Confederate property, which included enslaved people, while giving recompense to black laborers who worked for the Union cause. Once word of the bill spread, droves of black people moved to seek freedom across Union lines. This mass movement ultimately led to the shift away from treating the refugees as contraband. They were now considered to be free people. This is what prompted President Abraham Lincoln to issue the Emancipation Proclamation at the outset of 1863. Although the Emancipation Proclamation marked the end of slavery, it was a long time before the news became reality for many who remained in bondage even after the right to citizenship was codified with the 13th Amendment, which was enacted in 1865, there were many more battles fought by black activists to not only be considered as citizens, but also equal in every way under the law. Today's structural racism is a holdover of ideas, policies, implicit beliefs, and laws that perpetuate a slaveholding mentality among whites, while resulting in greater rates of poverty, dispossession, criminalization, illness, and ultimately mortality for African-Americans. Quoting historian David Blight, the Black Lives Matter counter argument to the extra legal killing and oppression of black people is more than a century old. You can visit therobinshouse.org for links to the brochure that I've just spoken to and other brochures on multiple topics relating to African-American history and current events. Uh, thank you very much for listening to me today.